If you're wondering who has been the biggest to smallest screen hog in the TV series Survivor, this video is for you. And if you're wondering who is the most under-edited Survivor contestant in the history of the show, that would be Whitney from Survivor South Pacific. For this video, I took every contestant that made it to the final Tribal Council, found their confessionals per episode, and made a Google Doc featuring almost 500 Survivor contestants' games. You know, as you casually do. For this video, I was advised I should only do jury and on, since with the pre-jurors the results get pretty wacky, which I'll also be talking about in this video. One final thing is I have to shout out Carly Leviz and Dan Ohm for letting me use their incredible Survivor CBS data, containing the average confessionals per episode, or CPA as I'll continue to call it throughout this video. Without this info, I genuinely wouldn't have a video. Both their tabloid and my Google document will be linked in the description. But back to Whitney. Survivor, excuse me, what? Out of all the contestants to give the worst edit to, you gave it to the last member of the Underdog Alliance. Cochrane flipped, he doesn't count. And Whitney was also an integral swing for a few rounds pre-merge, but the facts don't lie. In fact, while she's pre-jury and therefore not included, she's tied with Hope from Survivor Cara Moen as the most purple edited Survivor contestant. Both have 0.33 CPA, and this is really because Hope featured in three episodes and got a single confessional. Also on this list are Chelsea and then Leaf. Leaf I understand as he was more so fodder in the edit for Kim to pick off, and Troyzan was the more compelling, stronger underdog man anyway. But Chelsea? Ghost Island is renowned as one of the worst edited Survivor seasons, and Chelsea was a victim of this. Reports after the show state her as a strong player, and even apparently had a lot to do with the Bradley blind side. Instead, Survivor just gave us coffee confessionals, and while coffee is cool, seeing Chelsea on my screen would have been a lot cooler. Then finally, the woman we've all been waiting for, Purple Kelly. The literal woman where the origins of the purple edit came from, and she isn't even in the bottom three. I'm not gonna lie, I'm still mad that Whitney's at the bottom. Legend has it that the production was pissed at Kelly quitting, and so decided to erase her almost entirely from the show, especially because the other quitter, Nayonka, was just far better telly. I also think Kelly is just naturally quiet, as we see others on the show saying they don't see her talk much as well. The fifth smallest screen hog is actually our first returnee in Courtney Yates. Production, I just, I just want to know. How you made this happen? Out of all the returning characters on the show that made the jury, she was ranked the lowest. In total, Courtney received literally four confessionals across Heroes vs. Villains, which is upsetting, but also a testament to Courtney's entertainment value because every one of her confessionals are so good that she doesn't feel like a contestant that ranked 472nd place on this list. It should go without saying at this point, I'm not going to be talking about literally every Survivor contestant on this list, otherwise it would turn into a 6 hour live stream. And the last Northern Irish person that did a 6 hour live stream. So we'll skip JP and get to 470 with our first person to make it to the finale in Rick. It's Rick. I don't know what more you want me to say. Rick is essentially coach but without the quirky charm and ridiculous stories. Plus on a season with Ozzy, Coach, Russell's nephew and so on, if you're someone as normal as Rick, you'll be left in the dust. This then segues into Kelly Wigglesworth. She's in the bottom 10% of screen hogs and her case is pretty funny. In Cambodia, she got slightly over a confessional every two episodes on average in spite of receiving so much pre-season hype and essentially being the poster child for getting a second chance on the show. I want you to keep Kelly Wigglesworth in mind however, as by the end of the video you'll find out how ironic her placement here truly is. We'll then skip to Joe from Edge of Extinction at 460, which is probably one of the most interesting cases in Survivor. Joe had so much going for him. He was loved by the community, was only one of four returning players this season, and in fact this season was so recent I actually was in the 
the community at this time, and all I could remember was people complaining about how much Joe was being shoved down our throats. But he ends the season with 11 confessionals, which creates an interesting distinction. I feel Joe was more so talked about this season by other contestants, rather than actually shown in the confessional booth. So in that aspect, Joe could be considered a screen hog in regards to how much he was generally on screen, but confessional wise, not so much. But to play devil's advocate, Joe did spend a lot of time on the edge of extinction, and this was season 38, where there were far less activities. That season it was basically, we have this really cool idea where people go to an island after they're voted out. Oh cool, and then what? We didn't think that far ahead. So most of the Edge of Extinction crew were ignored in these episodes, except for one notable presence. Slightly higher on this list is Becky from Cook Islands, who has the worst average confessionals per episode total out of all the final Tribal Council members. Just for reference, Becky is the only one of two final Tribal contestants to make this bottom 10% band, and literally only got an average of one confessional per episode. And this was pretty insane considering this was one of three people in that season that eventually pitched their game to a jury so they could win one million dollars. In reality, Becky in the edit was simply overshadowed by Yule, who she was always aligned with, and Yule with his god idol, plus perspective of him being the figurehead of his alliance, was always going to take up a lot of their potential content. Slightly further, we reached Heather, who was the lowest ranked out of all the new school Survivor contestants between Survivor 41 and 40. Modern day productions seem to want to create seasons where everyone quote unquote gets their side of the story. Most contestants get their personal backstory showcased, the edits are a bit more even, and the most negative characters still are given positivity. While Survivor 41 does demonstrate many of these traits, it wasn't as consistent with its editing compared to 42 and 43. Although we'll never forget the days in the Edge community last year with Heather, despite her purple edit, it became a semi-viable winner pick around the final seven because all the big names were eliminated. So keeping that in mind, we just discussed Heather and next up is our first survivor winner, Natalie White. Let's be honest, we all knew Natalie would rank low on this list, but not a 442nd place. Natalie is quite an enigma on this list for a winner, as the next winner doesn't show up for a good amount of time. In total, she received a measly 15 confessionals, and her winning season was basically dominated by Russell, regarded by the Survivor community to be the biggest screen hog, but we'll get to him far later in this video. Just beyond her at 436 is Brett, the first quote unquote jury threat on this list. Taking into account after season reports, Brett would have likely curb stomped anyone in that endgame if he made it to the final three, which makes his lack of screen time in the confessional booth even more bizarre. On the topic of Bizarre, let's also move to Ozzy from Game Changers, who I feel is recognised as someone that was largely purpled in Game Changers by the community, but it's still crazy seeing Ozzy down here. Firstly, he was one of the six odd people that was a true Game Changer, was a massive fan favourite, and his other three appearances are far higher on this list. Overall, I think Ozzy's placement here is a great indicator that although you may be a big name coming into the season, the editors can just easily drop you from the edit. In fact, Ozzy has the lowest CPE of any Game Changer contestant to make it to the merge. And just to put it into perspective how under-edited these individuals were, next up is Reem. A first boot. Now Reem is the only first boot on this list. Like with all non-quitters on an Edge of Extinction season, she made the jury, so she's eligible for this ranking. That means she scored higher than Joe Anglum. In spite of her early boots and suffering the same fate as other people on Extinction, being that some episodes didn't even have those on the Edge, Reem makes up for that by essentially being the narrator. Due to being an over-the-top person as well as being the first boot on the edge, Reem commented on a lot of the new arrivals and developments on the edge. However, she still technically wasn't in the game after episode 1 and so falls into this bottom 10% band. Next is the bottom 20% with some notable placements. In fact, all from winners at war in this category we have Yule, Denise, Ethan, Kim and Sophie 
all very close to each other, which I feel is a result of more screen time being dedicated to The Edge rather than Season 38. At number 405, however, we have Alec from San Juan del Sur. And you might say, hold on, Bandit. That's not too surprising. In Season 29, it was kind of just there. And you're right. However, all the names we've covered on this list from Alec and before all got less screen time than Dance Below in Island of the Idols. Now Dan technically isn't in these rankings, he made the merge sure but was ejected and so didn't make the jury. But hopefully it goes to show how unredited these contestants have been. I mean, a man literally ejected from the game for inappropriate behaviour still got more confessionals per episode than several runners up and a winner. Thank you Survivor. The last contestant I want to talk about is Nick in the Australian Outback. Nick by himself was fine, and him being in the bottom 20% shouldn't be a massive shock. However, him being down here represents a massive shift between Borneo and the Australian Outback, at least edit-wise, where production were giving the rooting interest more confessionals rather than Borneo. As we'll see later with Borneo, it was very even, with it being pretty much the only season in Survivor history where the editors tried to stay as neutral and unbiased as possible. Next is the bottom 20 to 30% band, containing our first second place finisher in Courtney. So we get to talk about Courtney being under edited more. We've covered several third place finishers, even Albert is the next contestant above Courtney on this list. So while I'm annoyed Courtney is the lowest of the second place finishers, the fact she's the first second place finisher and made it to the bottom 20 to 30% bracket at least shows to some degree Survivor wants their runners up to have a decent edit. Which is cool. We'll pass by Albert, the South Pacific runner-up, to get to Sophie, the South Pacific winner. And because we've already talked about her winners at war game, that means we're all out of Sophie. I won't be discussing any more winners in as much detail as the last two, but you do have to feel a tad bad for Sophie being this huge Survivor fan, playing a good under the radar game, and then getting... 25 confessionals. It also highlights how much of a discrepancy Natalie White is as a winner, being on the bottom 10% of CPEs, well the next winner we covered is an entire two brackets ahead. On the topic of twos, next up are Will Sims and Parvati's winners at War Game. The two have absolutely nothing in common and then being about 25% isn't a huge shock. It's just funny to have one of the most popular Survivor players ever beside dead fish. And apart from Sandra's Heroes vs Villains game, a ranking in at 336, and the first appearance of Robin Winners Out War at 335, that wraps up this bracket. Within the bottom 40%, we have some big names like Aris in Blood vs Water, Gavin from the Edge of Extinction, Brandon in South Pacific, and that brings me to a fun discovery. I don't know if this was intentional by the producers in Edge of Extinction, but after rounding, all of David, Lauren, and Wardog have a CPA of 2.15. Due to the Edge of Extinction, all of them made a 13 episodes and had 28 confessionals each. Nonetheless, I find it pretty ironic that all of these lessos are on this list right next to each other. But that's not the only interesting case of screen time, because shortly thereafter we have both Missy and Jacqueline from San Juan del Sur. Again, I have no idea why this bracket is so nicely divided, but I'm gonna take it. Overall, they have 2.21 CPEs and 31 confessionals, plus they were also a part of the same alliance and were both part of the last two pairs standing. I should probably stop now before I keep thinking up more things they share in common. In the next bracket, we have both Parvati and Amanda from Micronesia, with Amanda surprisingly beating Parvati placement-wise, but then we get to Monica, then Dan. Some people may consider the biggest screen hog to be the person with the most confessionals in total, but this is a good example as to why the results drastically change when we find the confessionals per episode. For example, Dan would be far lower on this list where we take confessionals because he only had 22 confessionals. However, he only lasted 9 episodes. Monica got 34, but made it to the end of Blood vs Water, which was 14 episodes. So Dan actually got more confessionals every episode he was on, and therefore ranks higher. While this is the case, the results are a fraction of a difference, so it goes to show you can be an earlier boot and have a bigger presence. Beyond that, we have several final tribal attendees like Julie, Dawn, Natalie and Winners at War, 
and Romeo. Which then gets us exactly halfway in this list, which for anyone wondering, the most average CPE totals come from Kaga Yan's Tasha Fox and Kelly Goldsmith from Africa. Both have the average confessional total of 2.55 to 2.56. So that's the average confessionals per episode you should be expecting if you went out to play Survivor for yourself. But this middle bracket is kind of all over the place. You'd have people you'd expect to be here, Baylor from San Juan del Sur, Vesepia from Arcasis, Brad from Game Changers, and the list goes on for final tribal pictures. However, on the other side of the coin, there are some real under the radar contestants that snuck up into this top half, like Taylor and MVGX, Jan in Thailand, or even Jamie the merge boot from Survivor China. The top 40% of this list, however, are a bit more interesting since this is the tier where the big screen hogs, just in general, have their first games crop up and some other multi-time players have their last game. For example, Rupert's lowest CPE game is here, his Heroes vs Villains game, at number 184, as well as Ozzy three times. All of his Cook Islands, Micronesia and South Pacific games in that order, by the way, are under this bracket. There are also instances of other Survivor Legends last appearances, such as Joe Anglim's Worlds of Park game, as well as Amber in All Stars. Oh, and it's finally important to note Erica lands at 175, which is remarkable considering how, almost universally, it's identified Erica had an awful pre-merge edit for a winner and shows the power in getting a lot more confessionals coming into the merge and being able to smash an hourglass. On the topic of the three newest kids on the block, in the top 30% let's continue on to Marianne. Marianne had a very unique personality on Survivor and especially as a winner. Several of her confessionals were also high energy and fun so it makes sense why the editors used her in much of the show. However she isn't the modern winner with the highest confessionals per episode total and this instead goes to the infamous Mike Gabler at 124. Within this bracket, finally, we have the top 100. And for anyone wondering, the top 100 placeholder is Brandon from Survivor Token Chains. Which, yet again, shows just because you're an earlier boot, it doesn't disqualify you from a high placement. For anyone struggling to remember who Brandon was since Token Chains was a while back, he was one of Coach's enemies. Yeah, that really doesn't help narrow anything down. But before I conclude this bracket, just after Brandon in 99th is Kim Spradlin from Survivor One World, showing she was dominant in the game and largely in the confessional booth as well. Now into the top 20%, beginning with Evie from Survivor 41, who I believe had the most confessionals within the first two episodes of a Survivor season by the time of Survivor 41. Obviously this assisted her high placement and we'll discuss further with another similar individual. From one of the highest CPE totals in their season to, very bizarrely, one of the worst is Rudy. Rudy is 91th on this list and is the first person from Borneo we'll be discussing. If you remember way back in this video, I brought up Nick from the Australian Outback. The season after Borneo, who had the lowest CPE total and was in the bottom 20%. Rudy has the worst CPE total for Borneo and is in the top 20%. This indicates two things. Firstly, it seemed around the Australian outback, there was more structure and identity to the show, where Borneo was just, put 16 people on the island and see what happens. Secondly, Borneo was very clear it wanted quote unquote everyone to have their side of the story. Where often one person would talk about an issue, sometimes from the real world, in their confessional, and then another would bring up a counter viewpoint. It's a bit ironic that this mentality of having a more fair edit has now cycled back into the modern seasons 21 and more years after Borneo, creating a situation of irony where the more things change the more they stay the same. We're going to pass both Carla and Owen from Survivor 43 and get to Cody who is very much the second half of the Evie point. Evie did have the most confessionals from the first two episodes but was overtaken by Cody in this achievement by the time of 43. So with such a strong start and a consistent edit thereafter, 68th place is fair. Humorously, right after Cody is Nayonka, who had about the top 15% of confessionals per episode, yet notably, 
quit the game. Considering Jeff was especially frustrated back in the day by those that quit, its all production gave so much content to Nyonka, and it's even more ironic that she got so much content when the other quitter Kelly was so purpled it has its own niche category of editing. But now into the top 10% bracket. This is the gold standard, the category you dream to be in as a survivor contestant on the show. And what better way to start it off at 47 with Mike Turner. Mike in 42 marks the beginning of this list, and I'll be honest, it didn't feel like he had the top 10% of confessionals per episode, but the facts don't lie, and fair play to him. I'll be honest though, there were a lot of expected individuals in this bracket, like Stephanie from Guatemala, Jesse from Survivor 43, or Malcolm in the Philippines. These individuals form huge parts of their season, and are talked about a lot in the community. That's fine, but then there are some really under the radar picks that snuck in here that I didn't expect, like Helen from Survivor Thailand, Jenna Louise from Borneo, and Keith from the Australian Outback. I mean, name me one non-cooking confessional from Keith you can remember. And he's number 40. Russell and Tony, both in their Heroes vs Villains and Winners of War games, achieve 30th and 29th. These two are unique instances in that they've cracked the top 30 twice with their games that got them to the final Tribal Council. So while I can talk about them as characters now and why they got this high, I might as well do it later on this list when we get to their highest place in games. Shortly past those two, at 24th is the highest modern day Survivor player in Chantel Smith. Despite being one of the earliest boots left on this list, it's fair to say Shan was shown a lot in her limited time in Survivor 41. I mean, there's a Shantham, her very notable relationship with her cards, and her being the figurehead for the creation of the Black Alliance. Chantel is quite clearly the biggest presence of modern Survivor, and considering the more even editing approach of Survivor 42 and beyond, it'll probably be a while until someone takes her crown. On the topic of females with lots of screen time, I'm actually going to fast forward to number 6 on this list, with the female that has the highest CPE total of them all. Yes, for anyone wondering, this means all the final five consist of men. When you're thinking of the highest placing female in this video, there's got to be some front runners. You may think it would be Stephanie from Palau, but no. You may say Kathy from Marquesas, but also no. For those thinking it's Jerry from Survivor Season 2, you're also wrong, although she is number 10. In fact, the female at the very top is the first ever runner up, Kelly Wigglesworth. This really recontextualizes things as Kelly by far has the biggest fall from grace. She was the biggest female screen hog in Borneo and even 23 years later. Only in Cambodia to have one of the worst CPA totals like ever. But again, as covered with Rudy, Borneo was more confessional based as a season and Kelly being the runner up would have been no different. Then the last the moment you've all been waiting for, the fifth biggest screen hog in Survivor is Boston Rob. This should be a surprise to nobody. Coming into Redemption Island, Rob is one of the two returning players, which will cause an N8 confessional boost, but also Survivor clearly have a soft spot for him. This was the fourth season he participated in in nine years, so obviously they were going to show him off. Next might be a bit of a blind side, but it's the original king of Survivor, Richard Hatch. Many Survivor fans consider the show to be a microcosm of life, and while I don't necessarily agree, if I had to pick a season to best depict society, it would be Borneo. There were many conversations surrounding marriage, sexuality, and general morality. Rich evidently was a massive part of these talks, and his CPE total is also boomed by the show focusing more on the contestants surviving rather than strategy. There were no idols, abandoned islands, or advantages. It's just people talking. It's why the lowest ranked individual was, again, Rudy in the top 20% category. This is more so Borneo's presentation being vastly different, rather than Richard Hatch being a screen hog per se. That being said, Russell Hans can be argued as anything but a screen hog. Samoa was basically the Russell show, where most of the community can call it Russell Island, and everyone knows they mean Samoa. 
There's been lots of talk in the community about how to avoid the purple edit, and really playing a game like Russell is the best way to do it. You find advantages, play them, create a revolutionary strategy, and have lots of longevity. This is all further accentuated by Russell's immediate following appearance in Heroes vs Villains. He again was dominant that season and production, I guess, used Samoa as a way to hype up Russell's return. But Russell was always going to be expected to do well on this list. Let's be honest. And number two is the iconic podcast host himself, Rob Sesternino, who in the Amazon yet again showed off a lot of revolutionary gameplay. Watching Rob in season six is like watching season one all over again, where he was critiqued constantly for not playing morally and riding the swing position alongside Matthew. Rob definitely was a pioneer of a more aggressive gameplay style, which is far more common nowadays, but was even replicated just after his appearance with the likes of Fair Play in the season after. But unfortunately for Rob, the bell has gone, and so has his chances of making it to number one. I don't have my own bell here, but I can edit one in. And that's what we call a transition because at number one, the biggest screen hog of all of Survivor, the undisputed face of the show himself, is Jacob Derwin? Well, let's explain. This is why at the beginning of the video, I was going to do everyone that made the jury and beyond because early boots have really skewed results. Jacob has the highest confessionals per episode by far out of anyone in American Survivor. In fact, he has far more than anyone in any English speaking Survivor. He even beats out everyone in Australian Survivor, which has notably bloated episodes. There's a lot of talk about an early boot season in the community, and if Survivor US decides to go ahead, they may cast Jacob Derwin. Jacob, I don't know if you watch these videos, but if you do, don't agree to it. This is the one Survivor statistic you have, and unless you get over 15 confessionals per episode, you're at a net loss. But as promised, the true number one of this list is Tony from Survivor Kagayan, with 97 total confessionals and an insane average confessional total of 7.6 confessionals per episode. Tony is a lot of people's favourites, so I'm sure they're happy to see him be number one on this list, and considering how he is such a great TV character, some may even consider him the best, production is obviously going to show him off. Add in his several idle finds, chaotic strategies, and weirdly consistently good editing of Kagayan, he lives to llama yet another day. This video took a long time to make, so make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed. Check out this video where I make an international rivalries cast. I'm peace.